Aloha, everyone. Aloha. From freezing cold, god awfully cold Washington. Um, thank you for inviting me in. I'm really sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, it looks like a great room full of people. Um, I want to give a little bit of update about the TPP, and I want to start out just by talking a little bit about what the TPP project is, and then I will update on um, what the latest developments are, if that sounds like a good plan. Um, so just to start with about the TPP, it was something launched in the U.S. involvement was launched in 2008 by George W. Bush. This is an agreement that originally was started with Singapore and Chile and a few other countries. They called it the Pacific Four. And it was their idea, basically, of doing a NAFTA-style agreement, like the North American Free Trade Agreement, very corporate-friendly. And originally, it was supposed to include all of the APEC countries. And most of the Asian and Pacific countries said, no, thank you. <laughs> We don't need to do NAFTA. We saw what happened when the U.S., Mexico, and Canada did that. Not so good. So the P4 was just those countries for a long time. And then George Bush asked if he could join. Negotiating to expand the P4. So that's 2008. Um, President Obama originally said he wasn't going to be part of it because he needs to review. It didn't look like the right kind of agreement. But unfortunately, by the end of 2009, the Obama administration had joined also. So the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, now has 12 countries involved. The countries have met since Obama 20 times. They call those rounds of negotiations. The agreement has 29 chapters, but only five of them have anything to do with trade. The other 24 chapters are basically like a sneaky Trojan horse that has stuck into it all kinds of other policies, most of which already have been rejected either by the U.S. Congress or state legislatures or in some other instances by the parliaments in Chile or in Australia or New Zealand. It's a whole smorgasbord of corporate wish list items. And these are items that if the TPP would go into effect, the way that it works is the first provision is each country shall ensure the conformity of all of its laws, regulations, and administrative procedures with this whole stack of agreements, chapters that have nothing to do with trade. So whatever you think about the trade part, that's not what this is mainly about. Mainly, this is about all this other stuff. So what is the other stuff? Number one, it's new investor rights that would allow any foreign investor operating in any of those other countries to skirt U.S. law and our courts and to sue the U.S. government in an international tribunal using World Bank rules that would allow any company that thinks it's not getting what it's newly gotten as privileges in the agreement to sue against any U.S. policy or government action that they think undermines their expected future profits. Really. So what this would mean is U.S. laws that have passed our courts, that Congress has passed, or the state legislature in Hawaii, that the state court has said are fine, Maybe the same corporation has challenged this law in the state court or in the U.S. federal court, and the U.S. courts say, no, this is fine. The foreign corporation would be elevated to the same level as a whole sovereign country to privately enforce the TPP, to go to an extrajudicial tribunal and attack our law and demand compensation, unlimited compensation from our taxpayer money, for any policy or government action they think undermines their expected future profits. Now, if this sounds so crazy that you think this lady in Washington must be having a nightmare and I'm talking in my sleep, <laughs> actually, there's a smaller version of that in NAFTA. And already over $400 million have been paid out to corporations for these sneak attacks in these tribunals. 
And it's been not for anything having to do with trade, but it's been attacks on bans on toxic substances, rules on land use, who's able to own land, how land can be regulated. Control of water is another very infamous case. Rules around energy. There's even a case right now where Eli Lilly is suing Canada for medicine patent standards. There's another case where Philip Morris is suing about tobacco regulation, just the labeling of packages to try and make it not attractive to, to get kids to smoke. There's another case where in Canada, Canada has to pay Exxon Mobil tens of millions because they put a renewable energy fee for any company, domestic or foreign, that would get a contract to explore natural gas, to try and invest in coming up with sustainable energy for the future. All of these things have been declared to violate the treaty rules, and then you have to pay. This is a very dangerous provision. It has nothing to do with trade. It's just a pure corporate empowerment agenda. We know this is in there, even though the TPP negotiations have been incredibly secret, because that chapter leaked. We've seen that. After years of being told it wasn't there, the chapter leaked and we saw it. It's there. You can see that chapter on our website with a basically a guided tour through the jargon. Our, our website is tradewatch.org. So we scanned in that leaked text and explained what it means. Another of the non-trade provisions would increase medicine prices. So the big pharmaceutical companies, as everyone knows, are always looking to get new monopolies. They get a patent, a license, to have sole right to sell medicine when they discover a new medicine. And during the period of their patent, which under U.S. law is 20 years, they can charge any price they want. So everyone there has probably at some point bought Motrin or Advil, ibuprofen. So we buy a whole big thing of it, and the whole thing is $10, $11 at the, at, at the drugstore. But I remember when it was still in patent, and my grandmother took this for arthritis. Each pill was $20, and that was, you know, 25 years ago. So, for instance, the generic version of HIV AIDS medicines that many of the TPP countries need to rely on, because it includes Vietnam, it includes Malaysia, developing poor countries, Chile, Mexico, Peru. Right now, a generic version of a treatment for HIV and AIDS for one year is about $300. The same treatment in the U.S., the health insurance companies under patent have to reimburse over $15,000 a year. This is the difference between life and death. The TPP chapter on intellectual property also leaked. It was a wiki leak. This happened one month ago. If you Google TPP intellectual property wiki leak, you can look at the chapter. What would it do? It would extend patents, especially for medicines for cancer, through a process called evergreening, or if they find a new use for a drug, even after the 20 years of monopoly, they get another 20 years, without changing anything, without investing any money or creating anything new. It would set a rule that Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates can be challenged by the pharmaceutical companies. So all of those benefits we got, the potentially good thing in Obamacare of more use of negotiating by the states to lower prices, gone. For folks who have military families, the TRICARE, the military health care program, same thing, higher prices. We have a whole study, if you want to go into the details of that, about this provision, because again, it leaked. You can see it at tradewatch.org. The bottom line is all of our medicines would be more expensive in our country and for people in the developing countries that are in TPP. Because of the 12 countries, you know, there's some rich countries, the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, some middle ones like Singapore but there are a lot of developing countries. So there are a lot of people in Malaysia and Vietnam who have need generic medicines for cancer, for diabetes, for HIV, AIDS, for malaria. This would literally be life or death. Outrageous. What's that doing in a trade agreement? It's a monopoly. Another chapter would undermine internet freedom. So everyone raise your hand if you remember SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act. Remember that huge fight I see people need it? Yep, exactly. So last year, in a wonderful citizen uprising, the public and Google and then Congress shut that thing down. It was outrageous. It would have done things like, for instance, if you, as someone who is not selling things illegally on the internet, but you made repeated small-scale violations, like just for instance, I bought a recipe for cooking dinner, 
and I paid two dollars for it. And I made dinner for one of you, and you said, Lori, that's great, send me the recipe. I'm not doing anything criminal, I don't even think about it. I send you the recipe. That's a copyright violation. I should make you pay the two dollars. If I do that repeatedly on your sofa, number one, I would have a ten thousand dollar fine. Number two, eventually I would be cut off the internet. The internet service provider would be made liable and they'd throw you off. Obviously, Congress said forget about it. A huge chunk of that is stuck in the back of the copyright chapter of TPP. Here's another doozy. We have to import food that didn't meet U.S. safety standards. And one of the most worrisome products is actually fish. So in the U.S., Hawaii sends fish to the U.S. mainland. It's one of the big exports. Right now, Vietnam, Malaysia also want to send us fish. They send quite a bit. They don't have the same safety standards. So they're sending fish that don't meet U.S. standards. It gets sent back. Under TPP, we'd have to accept anything that the other country said was equivalent levels of safety. This is a huge public health issue, but also for the U.S. states, for instance, who, who rely on fisheries, this is also a very serious economic issue. Then there's a whole chapter in the agreement, embrace yourselves, this always makes people crazy. It sets limits on what governments can do spending our tax dollars. So you know how when the U.S. federal government spends money, some of it's through Buy American. And what that means is, for certain things that the government buys, they preference things made in the U.S., which is great, because that means our tax dollars get reinvested into our communities to create more jobs. Hawaii has a lot of buy local rules, from school lunch, from the whole farm to school program that not many states have, but Hawaii was one of the leaders. All of those buy local, buy Hawaii, buy America, all of those preferences for the domestic relating to government expenditures would just be banned and forbidden to be used. Outrageous, right? What's that doing in a trade agreement? Another chapter of the agreement would limit financial regulation. Unfortunately, in many of these instances, it's been the U.S. who's been the country pushing the bad thing. So while in Congress we had an improved financial regulation, here in TPP, for instance, one of the things the U.S. will not change its mind on is a ban on the use of what are called capital controls. Those are the rules that basically when you're in the middle of a financial crisis, if money's starting to rush in because there's a bubble starting, you can put up a rule that says, okay, you can invest here, but if it's in this sector that has a bubble, you can't take it out for a year. So before you come in, be careful, because you don't want the money sloshing it out and destroying the economy. Or if there's a run in your currency and all the money's going out, you freeze the outflow of money. Those tools that even the International Monetary Fund says countries should use, to avoid another global financial crisis, every TPP country would be banned from this. Plus, the TPP has the rules that would incentivize the outsourcing of jobs. These are rules, for instance, that create, that basically create protections and privileges if you leave. So everything from call centers and service sector jobs to manufacturing, which I know is not manufacturing, is not a huge industry in, in but all of the service sector jobs that could be done offshore, those rules in the investment chapter make it easier. And then there are all the things that Congress has said has to be in the agreement, and those are some of the other chapters, but those are the chapters that actually aren't finished. So what we saw, just to now mix a little bit of what's in there with what's happening, is the Obama administration, as folks will remember when APEC was in Hawaii, kept setting deadlines, and they kept missing deadlines. And so 2012 was the dead, 2011 was the deadline that didn't work. Then we had the APEC declaration saying, ah, we almost have a deal. 2012 was the next deadline, and they didn't make it. Now it was 2013, do or die. And so last week in Singapore was what's called a ministerial <coughs> summit. That's when the actual trade minister, so the U.S. trade representative, by his equivalents, his peers, the trade ministers from all those other countries, got together and tried to make a final deal. And documents leaked again. You can see them on the Huffington Post. If you Google Huffington Post, TPP Singapore is a scathing expose with all the documents. And basically what it showed, which is heartbreaking, is that the US was basically busting people's kneecaps to get the stuff for big pharmaceutical companies on patents, to stick to the limits on financial regulation, to sneak in the backdoor sofa, 
but they weren't getting the stuff that Congress demanded actually get in this agreement. What were those things? A guaranteed labor chapter enforceable with a floor of international labor organization standards. So I'm not trying to impose the U.S. standard on the whole world, but every country in that agreement has at some point or another signed an agreement that's the international labor organization saying they'll allow things like union bargaining. Except a bunch of those countries like Vietnam ban all independent unions. And their own labor department just got done telling us that the Vietnam has forced labor, child labor. So this labor chapter is very important, not done. An environment chapter that's binded that basically says things like trade in endangered species, trade in illegal logs, illegally harvested tropical logs, using uh, lowering of investment standards, gotcha, three more minutes, to bring down standards, that's not in there. Another really important issue is currency. So will there be standards to stop the other countries from lowering their currency to get an advantage? Not in there. So what's bad is almost done. What's not in there are the good things, and the new idea is to try and finish the whole thing in the next three months of next year. Now, the only good news is, all around the world in the TPP countries, the more details leak out, the more people are opposing. So, for instance, if you go to our website, this is a website that's just about TPP called ExposeTheTPP.org. You can see pictures of the brave protests in Malaysia where it's illegal to have a protest, you get arrested. AIDS activists have done these wonderful flash protests. Or you can see the protests in New Zealand, in Chile, in Australia, in Peru. And so people are starting to fight back, they're waking up, but it's like a race against time. So in Singapore, there's this great desperation. They were dying to make a deal because they want to get it sealed before actually there's too much uproar. TPP is kind of like a dead fish. The longer it's in the sunshine, the worse it's smelling. And the worse it's smelling, the more people are looking. And so they're keen to get that thing signed and sealed before everyone realizes what it would do. And then in the U.S., they're trying to get a process called fast track. This is an anomaly, outrageous procedure that Nixon cooked up in 1973. It's rarely been used, but it was used for the World Trade Organization and NAFTA. What it would do is allow for the crazy TPP to be signed before Congress votes on it, even though Congress has exclusive constitutional authority over trade, and it would allow the thing to be railroaded through Congress, no amendments, limited debate, and with any other Christmas tree items put in, with Congress not allowed to amend a word, the executive branch writes the legislation. So this would basically be the only way TPP could go into effect. Because the very good news is, even in the U.S. Congress, even with some of the very conservative, crazy congressmen, you can imagine the Tea Party guys are not loving these foreign tribunal panels or the ban on Buy America. So this is actually an issue where the left and the right can agree. They may not know what they agree is a good trade agreement, but they are on to the fact that the TPP is a Trojan horse that's being called a trade agreement, but actually is trying to roll through Congress all kinds of things Congress has already said no to. So the biggest value-added contribution in the United States for campaigners is to make sure there's no fast track. In every country, there's a different kind of campaign going on. In Australia and New Zealand, it's about the threat to their national health care systems that those medicine rules would have. In Peru, it's about internet freedom. In Chile, it's about the investment rules attacking the environment. Every country is a different thing. For us, it's stopping fast track, and it's something all of us can do. So, here is the absolute thing to do. It was a letter that had 152 Democrats on it. Wonderfully, both Tulsi Gabbard and Colleen Hanabusa were on it. This is a fight that's going to be in the House. We know Tulsi's going to vote no. Not so clear for Congressman Hanabusa. So, from Hawaii, the number one piece of business is to get a guarantee that the Congresswoman, the Congressman Hanabusa, and I thank both of them for signing the letter, but make sure that they're ready to vote no, because that fast track process is going to come up with a request that Congress give away their constitutional trade authority as soon as the second week of January. And I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you. And I sure wish I could hear you guys. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we can do question and answer by phone. We can do question and answer by phone. Okay, so uh, why don't I pass the phone around? Uh, that would be oh, the easiest yes. thing. Huh? Give it to Darlene. Sure. Okay. okay, we'll have question and answer. Thank you so much because we know you're five or six hours ahead. Yeah. Any questions for her? Really quick, from anything that she said. Okay, Isaiah, and then, okay, we have one question from Isaiah. And then Mark. Hi there, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, one of my questions, ma'am, is you mentioned the medicinal problems and health concerns based on imports of food and other items. Are there any other public health concerns tied in with TPP? Yes, that's a very good question. And because I was trying to be as brief as possible, I didn't mention some other really serious problems. One is about tobacco. So there has been a huge heartbreaking fight about this. The way the current investor rules work and the market access, the tariff rules, countries and include Singapore, Malaysia, that have done really wonderful things to limit tobacco and to limit the marketing of tobacco to women and children. All of these good public health measures would be subject to attack as illegal trade barriers. Again, nothing to do with trade under the agreements. So the U.S. was allegedly going to put forward an exception to allow this, these kind of policies. They chickened out. It was disgusting. And then Malaysia came in with this wonderful, absolute carve-out. And now the U.S. is beating the crap out of Malaysia, trying to get them to drop it. So if you care about tobacco regulations, basically rules to try and help people not start to smoke and marketing rules, that's a very serious problem. Another very big public... We have another question. Hi, Lori. Um, a lot of this seems like it's a... Hello? Keep going, I can hear you. Okay. Um, a lot of this sounds like a threat to democracy, uh, the sovereignty of people to use the governance to protect our rights against corporate rule. Now, with the upcoming elections, there may be a small opportunity to use the democratic process, what little exists in the United States, in order to make <laughs> candidates compete against each other to assure us that they're looking out for our interests. Do you have any ideas? You mentioned Colleen Hanabusa. She, of course, is running for the U.S. Senate against Brian Schatz. I frankly don't have confidence in either of them on their views on this. And also in our first congressional race to replace Colleen Hanabusa, I don't have any confidence in any of the candidates except for Catherine who's here uh, that they are going to take a strong stand on this. So how can we use the election process and the modicum of democracy that it provides to force this issue? That's a great question. Um, so people around the country and all the other states are also thinking about this. And so what a lot of people are doing now is they're creating candidate questionnaires. And I can get back to somebody there can basically contact me. I can get back with a draft candidate questionnaire because a lot of people have been doing that. You basically get the questionnaire to each of the candidates in a race. So both Senator Schatz, for instance, and Congressman Hanabusa in the instance of that primary, or for the first congressional district, anyone who's running, you ask, and you, ideally you have a bunch of groups asking. So you have the Sierra Club in Hawaii, you have Unite Here Local 5, you have local community groups, all with the similar questions, which are very direct. Will you oppose the delegation of Congress's constitutional trade authority through fast track, giving away your ability to save us from getting slammed by the TPP. Yes or no? <laughs> it's a yes or no question. You're either for it or against it, and it needs to be on the record. Will you support a TPP that contains any of the texts on foreign tribunals to challenge our laws, on the intellectual property rules to jack up medicines that are currently there? Yes or no? It's a yes or no answer. Those kinds of very direct questions on the road to an election are a very leveraged point. And many people, when Kali Hanabusa signed the letter that had the other 151 Congress people on it, I mean, people needed CPR here in Washington because she had refused and refused and refused. And we assumed the only thing that made her do it was thinking about the election. So you have a lot of leverage there. And this vote is gonna be before the election. This vote could happen as soon as the end of January. So this is worth it if you start doing it right now. And also, you know, over, Congress is now back. They're on, actually, probably Hawaii's members are not back since it's a long flight, but they had their last vote. 
about nine hours, eight hours ago, six hours ago. So they're, they're not going to be there until the second week of January. And so it's also just an opportunity to go to office hours. If you look on the member's website, a lot of them have holiday office hours. You can just go in and ask the question also, just face to face. But getting the question, the candidate questionnaires is critical. Okay. Yeah, thank you. We'll say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.